Hey, so I'm all right. How you feeling, man? Everything is good. Yeah, just uh, the, the sisters need to get some too. Yeah. Uh, you know what, but Arifi. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It was good. As as usual. As usual. Aikum salam, salam alaikum. Kim al hal? Alhamdulillah, khair. Inshallah. Okay. Yes. Alright, so before we start, inshallah, I want to just say a couple of things, and also, as was mentioned in the group chat, Brother Nu'man mentioned it, he spilled the beans. <laughs> um, may Allah reward the brothers who donated these books, the company who published them, they gave permission to have copies of this made for as a gift for those who come to the class regularly consistently this book is an explanation of the 40 hadith of imam al nawawi by sheikh abdul muhsin al abbad who is one of the senior scholars currently living he is actually subhanallah he's very old and he's not healthy these days um, he actually retired from teaching in the Islamic University of Medina he retired I believe a year and a half ago maybe two years ago and he retired from teaching in the Prophet's Masjid within the last year uh, he's actually the first person to give a single lesson in the Islamic University of Medina the first person and this book of his a lot of the notes that I share in our weekly class come from this book. 
Um, I've been anticipating the, the arrival of these books for some time, and alhamdulillah, Allah will. They were delivered yesterday. Alhamdulillah. So, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a copy of this book to those brothers who and sisters who've come regularly. So the way this is going to work is like this. On the sister side, I don't keep track of who's coming or how many are coming. However, there are some sisters that are very consistent with this class. So if there's a sister who's consistent with the class, not only is her husband going to get a copy if he's here, but she's going to get a copy. And if there is a child who is a part of that family that's been consistent in this class, the child is going to get a copy of this book as well. So we're not going to do it where just like one book per household, but this is a gift for those who have shown consistency, commitment, and, and coming to these doodles. And this is going to serve as a, a way for you to review and even before class. For example, next week we'll be doing, inshallah, Hadith 19. Before coming to class is actually good if you go read the Hadith, right? And also even read the explanation. No problem. Alhamdulillah. It's a very nice. The way this was put together in the translation is very good quality. I was looking for Bengali translations for this book, but I couldn't find anything that I could uh, get bulk uh, print. So if any of you brothers know someone, you have a connection, whether it be in Bangladesh or here in the States, uh, preferably an explanation of the 40 Hadith. Not just the translation of the 40 hadith, but an explanation. I would love to give that because I know that some of the brothers here, they don't read or speak English very well. Um, but even with that, if you've been coming regularly, you're still going to get a copy, inshallah. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, I think we should start with the sisters. Do you have an idea of how many sisters come there regularly? Five. About five. Some of them become, but they don't come because they're sick today. They're sick today, okay. Three of them. Okay. So those sisters who are regularly come, but they're not here today that are sick, we're going to put those three aside. <coughs> if you know them, you can take them, inshallah, and give them. Um, and then as for the other sisters that are present, we want to give them something, inshallah. So if someone can just bring this to the sister's side, I will, I will deputize you because you know the three who are ill. So there's five. You think we should do six? Uh, yeah, I need another two. Another two? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, there are some brothers who regularly come, but I don't see them tonight. But mashallah. And I'm not good with all of your names, so please forgive me if I don't know your name. I know you. I already You already have a copy. Inshallah. We're going to start with the elder, the sheikh here. Who always asks the good questions? What's his name? Yes, yeah, for him. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah. For you, brother. Here, Logan. You, 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 you bring it to the, bring it to the two brothers in the back there. The brother walking towards you. The brother said. Give to Brother Jawad and the young man sitting there with the glasses. With the glasses. I know you you are consistent. You are consistent. Hey Logan, come. The brother there. Yeah. Way up, way up. Yeah, he already got the copy. Earlier when I, ha I actually had some copies uh, a couple of months ago, so a couple of the brothers, they had already gotten the copy. All right. Um, yeah, so inshallah, we'll, we'll probably keep five in the masjid for those brothers who didn't come tonight. And then the others uh, I will take with me. Alaykum salam salam. Come and take the copy. Give it to the brothers then. These are your copies, brothers. So with these copies, you can, yani, 
your own personal copy, you can even write in it. It's okay. It's not considered disrespect, right? Uh, these books are really, really good. I also suggest, along with the book, you should have maybe even if you haven't already purchased a notebook, composition or something, any book that you are reading, try to make it a habit to have a notebook for that book. Or if you have multiple books you're reading, maybe get a five subject notebook and each section put the title. And as you're reading the book, uh, highlight, circle, but any point, any fatty, the benefit that jump out at you, write it down in the notebook. That is how, that is the best way to read a book. <laughs> best way to many people, they read the book, they just read it like this. But actually writing down what's there, just like in a class. Is one of the most beneficial ways to rememorize what it is that you are reading. It stands out, especially when you see a hadith. When you put the hadith, don't just say, don't just write the name, the hadith, the words of the hadith, but also write the name of the Sahabi, the companion who narrated the hadith. Right? Write down, you know, whether it, what book of hadith it's in. You should write those things down. It's really helpful for you, inshallah. Now, with that being said, I'm still going to bring handouts because these handouts that I put together, we ran out of handouts? No, no, no. man, he wants it. Inshallah, <laughs> in the front, we're going to leave uh, these in the uh, five, we're going to leave these in the masjid, inshallah. Um, The handouts that I prepare, the the benefits, they're not coming from just one explanation. There's multiple. I think I mentioned that when we first started this class. Um, we are using the explanation of Sheikh Sa'ad al-Shithri, who is one of the current senior scholars. We're using the explanation of Ibn Rufaymin. We're using the explanation of Sheikh Abdul Muhsin, Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan, uh, there's a sheikh in Egypt. I brought his book a lot. Sheikh Khalid Uthman al-Musri, his soft-covered book, he brings multiple points from various different... So we come in from different uh, books. So this is excellent. This is really nice. He summarizes in a very nice manner. But in the handouts, there's also some, some benefits too, as you're going to see tonight, inshallah. So, yeah, inshallah. We'll leave these in the, the masjid. So that those brothers who regularly come who didn't get a copy, inshallah, they'll be able to uh, get a copy. We're going to leave a copy. Yeah, this is a really good. May Allah reward the brothers who did this uh, translation. This is an excellent, excellent job. I became Muslim in 1995. And at that time, we didn't we had some good books translated in English, but nothing close to what we have today. Mashallah. Yani with each 10 years is getting better and better. But I will say this, even though we have a lot of translations, that does not negate the need, nor does it replace the, our, the responsibility for us to learn the Arabic language. Relying on the English translations, the Benga, Bengla <coughs> translations, relying on these translations is a, is a disservice to yourself. Well, yeah. It's a disservice to yourself. The Quran was revealed in the Arabic language. The Prophet ﷺ spoke the Arabic language. There are certain uh, benefits that are derived and extracted from the actual nus, the text, which is in Arabic, that you can't do that with in English. So it's really important to learn the Arabic language. And when you study the Islamic history, you see that wherever Islam went, Arabic went. If you look at the Islamic history, look at North Africa, East Africa, West Africa. Prior to those countries being colonized by the French, the Italians, the British, the Dutch, the, the Germans, those countries were Arabic-speaking countries, even though they were African, right? Even Turkey, there was a time Arabic was a spoken language there. Uh, parts of Asia, Arabic was a spoken language there. It was it was the thing. But when the British and the, these people came in, one of the first things they sought out to do is to get rid of the Arabic language. Because if you can get rid of the Arabic language, you can cut the people off from the Quran. 
Quran is in Arabic. Subhanallah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it is by Allah's blessing and favor that good deeds are completed. We stopped. We took a, a short break, break for the month of Ramadan, and we're now resuming these 40 hadith. They're after Salat al-Maghrib, and we're going until Salat al-Isha. It is a little later in the evening, but one thing Ramadan taught us is that we have the ability to be in the masjid for an hour or more. It doesn't hurt anybody. SubhanAllah, we benefit from being in the masjid. We benefit from learning. So this is very important. Tonight's hadith was narrated by two companions. Abu Dhar <coughs> al-Ghifari and Mu'ad ibn Jabal. We talked about Mu'ad ibn Jabal before. Can anyone tell me anything about Mu'ad ibn Jabal? Can anyone tell me anything about Mu'ad ibn Jabal? He was sent to the people of Yemen. The Prophet ﷺ sent him to Yemen. Who else did the Prophet send to Yemen? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the Prophet ﷺ sent those two to Yemen to teach the people of Yemen Islam and to call them to Islam. What else do you know about Mu'ad ibn Jabal? Mu'ad ibn Jabal, the Prophet wasallam said about him that he is the most knowledgeable of my ummah concerning the halal and the haram. Mu'ad ibn Jabal. The Prophet sallam said about him that on the day of judgment that he will come and behind him will be al-ulama. The scholars will be standing behind him. Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Mu'ad ibn Jabal was that, that man. He was a very important uh, companion. Uh, so was this other Sahabi, Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Who, who knows about him? No, no. Not Persian. That's Salman al-Farisi. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Him and his people, they're from a people, a place that is between Mecca and Medina. They were a very strong tribe. And... Uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari was one of the first people to become Muslim during the Meccan period. And he is the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided his entire tribe to Islam by way of him. His whole tribe became Muslim at his hand. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. He's a very important uh, personality. And the reason I take time to do this before we actually go into the hadith, because one of the things that we see today is that many of the Muslims really don't know the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Even the, even the most famous of them, many people don't know much about Abu Bakr. If you were asked the, the common person today, what is Abu Bakr's actual name? Abu Bakr is his kunya. What is his actual name? Most people, they don't know. You know, uh, We don't really know a lot about the Sahaba. And how can you love a people you don't know anything about or you know very little about? The more you know the Sahaba, the more you know about them, the more you know about their sacrifice for this deen, the more you're going to love them. And when you have love for them, it's not possible to have love for them and at the same time love those who? Yusubbuhum, who curse them, who insult them, who speak ill of them. Like a rafidah right? Who speak ill of the, the sahaba, who speak ill of the mothers of the believers. Okay, so this hadith is very important and it's timely. What a beautiful hadith to talk about right after the month of Ramadan, subhanAllah. An Abi Dhar, Jundub ibn Junada, wa Abi Abdul Rahman, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, radiyallahu anhuma. May Allah be pleased with the two of them. An Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal. Allah's Messenger said, Ittaqillah haythu ma kunt. Fear Allah wherever you are. Wa atba'a sayyi'a al hasana. Follow up a bad deed with a good deed. If you do a bad deed, if you do a sayyia, follow it up with a good deed and it will what? Tamhuha. It will wipe it out. hasan, And behave with the people with good character. Why did I say this hadith is a beautiful hadith to talk about right after Ramadan? Because the hadith said, have taqwa of Allah wherever 
wherever you are. Many Muslims treat Ramadan as if Ramadan is the only time that we're supposed to stay away from haram. Ramadan is the only time we're going to give sadaqah. Ramadan is the only time we're going to read the Quran from the beginning to the end. Ramadan is the only time we're going to do the night prayer. Ramadan is the only time we're going to, uh, you know, come to the masjid and spend time in the masjid. That's a problem. Because this hadith says, Ittaqillah haythu ma kun. Wherever you are. And the word haythu ma is different from the word aynama. Aynama is, has to do with place. Haythu ma, is, it includes place, time, and situation. No matter where you are, no matter what time it is, no matter what month, no matter what day, no matter what week, right? And regardless of what your situation is, ala kulli hal, in every situation, ittaqillah haythu ma kun. So we learn from this that taqwa of Allah have a wajib fi kulli waqtin, fi kulli zamanin, fi kulli makanin. It is obligatory in every time, in every place, no matter what the situation is. Taqwa Allah. Taqwa of Allah is mentioned 280 times in the Quran. Taqwa. In Surah Al-Baqarah alone, Taqwa is mentioned 30 times. Allah begins Surah Al-Baqarah by saying, Alif Lamim. Dalika al kitabu la rayba fihi hudan lil muttaqeen. That is the book regarding which or concerning which there is no raid, no doubt. Hudan, a guidance. Lil muttaqeen. For those who have taqwa. For those who possess taqwa. And then Allah cons concludes the surah by saying, Fansurna ala al qawmil kafirin. Aid us against the disbelieving people. The scholars, they said, there's a relationship between the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah and the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. In the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentions taqwa. Throughout Surah Al-Baqarah, He mentions taqwa 29 more times. And then He concludes Surah Al-Baqarah by mentioning Nasr. Nasr. Help. Aid. Assistance. Support. That means what? A prerequisite for Allah's help. If you want Allah's help, then you have to what? You have to have taqwa of Allah. In Tansurullah Yansurkum. If you aid Allah, Allah will aid you. The Prophet Wasallam said, Whoever wants Allah to respond to him during times of hardship should supplicate to Allah during times of ease. Whoever wants Allah to answer his dua, to aid him during times of hardship, shidda, then let him be mindful of Allah and supplicate to Allah during times of rakha, ease. This is very important, but very few take heed to these things. We also, we learn from this hadith that we're not perfect. We're going to fall short. Yani we have taqseer. Shortcomings. That's why the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, follow up a bad deed with a good deed. We're going to have shortcomings. And Allah has said in his book, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Verily the good deeds, they do away with the bad deeds. Before Ramadan, we spoke about the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, wherein the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us that when a person does a good deed, when he does a hasana, the hasana is written down 10 times up to 700 times or more. When a person does a bad deed, it is written down as only one. Right? This is from Allah's rahmah, from Allah's mercy for his slaves. When we commit a sin, it is written down as one, but the good deed is written down to at least 10 up to 700 times or more. And we said, what, what, what influences that multiplication is what's going on inside of the heart of the person doing the action. 
the presence of ikhlas, how much ikhlas, taqwa, all those things. This narration provides a, a manhaj, a methodology for the Muslim to utilize throughout his life. Utilize throughout your life. With respect to his relationship with Allah, himself, and the rest of the people. Relationships can be categorized into three categories. This hadith is an example. The first relationship is the relationship between you and Allah, al-Khaliq. The second relationship is the relationship between your, you and yourself. And the third is the relationship between you and others. Islam, although the first relationship is the most important relationship, Tawheed, Allah, that is the first and that is the most important. However, Islam is not only concerned with this relationship. Islam is also concerned with the other two. The relationship between you and yourself and the relationship between you and the people. And that's why the Prophet said, and behave with the people with good character. We already said that good deeds do away with evil deeds. Surah Hud, the verse there that I mentioned, in Al-Hasanat, Yudhibuna, that good deeds, they do away with the bad deeds. That is in Surah Hud. Although good character, husnul khuluq, is from taqwa, it is a part of taqwa, and we didn't define taqwa yet. I'm going to come back to it, inshallah. Although good character is a part of taqwa, in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it separately. He mentioned this separately to show how important this issue is. And this is something that we don't talk about enough as Muslims. Many Muslims today, unfortunately, have terrible character. Especially when it comes to our mu'amala, our interaction with each other. May Allah forgive me and may Allah forgive all of us. Allah, we have shortcomings in this area, even me myself. Yani, when we talk with each other, how many of us are quick to become angry with each other? How many of us, we are rude with our mouth, yani, the way we talk, even to our own families, how we talk with each other? Um, the way we conduct business with each other. When we go to the Kufar, we go to J.C. Penny. You know the price is there. You already know what the price is. You pay it. You go to the Muslim business. What the Muslim do, brother? Let me get a discount. Let me get a deal. Let me get this. Can I make it credit? Let me get. The, when I, I'm gonna pay you back. We don't treat. We treat the kafir better than we treat the Muslim. So much so that sometimes some Muslims don't want to do business with other Muslims because they're afraid that if they do business with the Muslim, maybe. It's the, the 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 relationship is going to go sour, so they would rather keep business out of the equation so that they can maintain the relationship with the brother. May Allah forgive us. Subhanallah. So taqwa, who can tell us what is taqwa? What's the definition of taqwa? Fear of Allah. Fear of Allah. This is typically the translation, fear of Allah. Yes. Consciousness of Allah. That's what you were going to say? The children. And the children, what do you have to say? What is taqwa? What do you say taqwa is? We'll accept that. He said remembrance of Allah. We'll, ac we'll accept that. He said what? Holy faith? Faith. Faith in Allah, Iman in Allah. We'll accept that. There is no one word in English to knowing Allah is watching you all the time. Say, get behind something, right? Uh, so, a waqaya is something that you put between yourself and whatever it is that you fear. Okay, so for example, we want to protect our feet, so we put on socks, and then if we're going to go outside, we put on shoes, right? If it's really, really cold outside, you, you, put a, you put a jacket on. You're putting something on to protect yourself from whatever it is that you fear. Let's take a look here. Uh... 
Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al Abad, he mentioned something really nice. He mentioned something really, really nice. Mashallah, I really liked it. Oh, thank you. Sheikh Abdul Muhsin, he said at the bottom of this page, 141, he said the phrase, fear Allah wherever you are. He said lexically, again, he's talking about the language. Taqwa means to guard yourself against all that you fear. For example, we wear shoes and slippers to protect against whatever harm that may be on the earth. We construct houses and tents to protect us against the heat of the sun and so on. Then he says in the Sharia, Sharia is the divine law. That's what it, Sharia means. When you hear Sharia, think about the divine law, the law that Allah prescribed. In the Sharia, taqwa means that a person protects himself from Allah's wrath, Allah's punishment. This takes place by doing what is commanded and abstaining from what is forbidden, believing in divine revelations and worshiping Allah according to his sharia, not through bid'ah, innovation. This is how we have taqwa of Allah, obeying Allah, doing what he told us to do, staying away from what he prohibited us from doing, worshiping Allah with his sharia, not worshiping Allah with the bid'ah, the innovation. That is a part of taqwa. He says, may Allah preserve him, taqwa in the sense of fear in Allah is required in all situations, places, and times. So one should fear Allah both in secret and in public as stated in the hadith, fear Allah wherever you are. All right? So the word waqaya, which we said is a shield. You put you, you, something you put between yourself and Allah. And if you understand this, then you understand the statement that the only way to flee from Allah is to Allah. Flee from his anger, from his wrath by going to him, by obeying him. That's what it means. To fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, when he said taq, when he defined taqwa, he mentioned four things. I didn't mention it in the notes. He said a taqwa is al-khawf, al-khawf min al-jalil, fear of al-jalil. Al-jalil is one of Allah's names. Wal-amalu bit tanzil and acting with the Tanzil, the revelation, meaning the Quran and Sunnah, the religion. Warrida bil Khalil, being satisfied with a little. And the fourth, Wal Isti'dadu li yawmi rahil. And and preparation for the day of the journey. This is how Ali radiallahu an he defined taqwa. You'll find this a lot in the books of the scholars that one scholar will define the word with this. Another will define it with that. If you look closely, there's no contradiction between their different mm -hmm. definitions, but they all have a different way of explaining it. Mm -hmm. Ali radiallahu anhu was very eloquent, mashallah. He has beautiful uh, words, subhanallah. Uh, so this is how he defined taqwa. Al-khawf min al-jaleel. Fear of al-jaleel. وَالْعَمَلُوا بِالْتَنْزِيلِ Acting with the tanzil. وَالْرِضَى بِالْقَلِيلِ Being satisfied with a little. وَالْإِسْتِعْدَادُ لِيَوْمِ الرَّحِيلِ In preparation for the day of the journey. The day, whether you, that, and when we say, when we talk about the journey, the journey is of two types. There's the journey of the death, where you're journeying from this world to Al-Barzakh. And then there's the journey where you're being resurrected from the grave and standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Death is called al-qiyamah, al-suhra, the minor qiyamah, and the standing on the day of judgment is called al-qiyamah, al-qubra, the major qiyamah. All right? So this is something, we can go on, we can mention other things about taqwa, but uh, 
because of time, um, I won't I won't go too much. And then Isha is coming in here what nine twenty seven? Is that what this says? Alhamdulillah. All right. One of the ways to achieve taqwa, brothers and sisters in Islam, is by what we're doing right now, sitting in the masjid and studying Islam, learning the religion. Yani al-ilm sababun. Knowledge is a sabab. It is a cause. It is a means of acquiring taqwa. How is that? In Surah Al-Baqarah, in verse 187, Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is over. Right? We said before Ramadan, and I'm sure the Imam mentioned during Ramadan, he made reference to those verses that we call the ayat of Siyam, the verses of fasting. They are what? What verse? Where, where do they start? Verse 183, and they end with verse 187. Verse 187. In verse 187, after Allah tells the Prophet and the rest of the Muslims, about uh, don't have relations with your wives while doing i'tikaf. Don't do that in the mas masajid. Allah says at the end of the verse, He said, Tilka hududullah. Those are the limits of Allah. Fala taqrabuha. Don't come near to them. And then Allah says, Kadalika yubayinullahu ayati lin nasi. Ah? And Thus does Allah make clear his ayat, his verses, for who? The people. Why? لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ So that they may يَتَّقُونَ So that they may acquire taqwa. So the scholars say, الْعِلْمْ سَبَبٌ taqwa. Knowledge is a means of acquiring taqwa. Because Allah said, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ So that they may acquire taqwa. From the standpoint that Allah mentioned that immediately after He said, Thus does Allah make clear His ayat for the people. This means, or this is a proof that every time Allah explains His ayat, Right? Every time those ayat, those verses are made clear to us, we increase in taqwa. And he's in, uh, yani, uh, what supports this is verse 28 of Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir is chapter 35 in the Quran. Verse 28, in the, in the verse, Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء the only ones who truly fear Allah from amongst his slaves are those who have knowledge, the scholars. So, فَكُلُّ مَزْدَادِ insan ilman. So the more a person increases in ilm, بِآيَاتِ الله, of the verses of Allah, is dada tuqa. He increases in taqwa. وَلِهَذَا يُقَالْ And for this reason it is said, مَنْ كَانَ بِاللَّهِ أَعْرَفْ كَانَ مِنْهُ أَخْوَفْ Allahu Akbar. It is said, whoever knows more, more about Allah, the more a person knows about Allah, the more a person fears Allah. The more a person knows Allah, the more a person fears Allah. Some of the children and some of the people may ask, how is that? Uh, I mean, why should we be afraid of Allah? Why be afraid of Him? Shouldn't we just love Him? And shouldn't we just hope for His mercy? And the reason this question comes is because usually when we're dealing with the creation, we fear what is not good, what is harmful, what is dangerous, right? But when we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a different type of fear. This is a different type of fear. It's not the same type of fear that you have uh, from the creation. No, and of course, from our religion, we don't just worship Allah with fear, but we also worship Him with love and with hope. Yes. So this is important. 
gaining knowledge is a means of acquiring taqwa. Why? Because how can you know how to, how, how will you know what to do? How will you know what to avoid? Were it not for acquiring knowledge. If taqwa is doing what Allah ordered and staying where he prohibited, that means what? You can't do that without knowledge. And there's a principle, a rule in the sharia that all the scholars agree upon. No matter what madhab you're from, they all agree. It says, مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبِ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ wajib. Anything without which an obligation cannot be fulfilled is itself an obligation. So if having taqwa of Allah is an obligation, but that cannot be fulfilled except by seeking knowledge, then seeking knowledge is itself an obligation. Very, very important. And this is one of the roles that the masjid plays. Not, not only just providing a nice, comfortable, warm, clean place for people to perform the salah, but one of the main functions of the masjid is to have durus, classes, where people can come and learn the religion of Allah. And here's the thing. Once these masajid establish this, it eliminates the excuse. It eliminates the excuse. See, many people hide behind the excuse, we don't have anyone here to teach. There are no classes. You know, people hide behind these excuses. But when these classes are here and the announcement is being made, even, mashallah, this time Allah made it so easy. This class is being aired live on Facebook. So even the people who cannot physically make it here, maybe the weather in some way, maybe you're feeling ill. You can still watch it. It's recorded. You can go back. You can rewind it. We have so many ways today to get knowledge. But where are the people who are taking that seriously? Taking, seeking knowledge seriously. If we said after the Salah, please stay back. We ordered pizza. Huh? We ordered pizza, halal, pepperoni, and sausage. Huh? The masjid will be packed. Maybe we will need to order more boxes because we didn't pre, we didn't know. But when we say the class is gonna be, subhanallah, this is a problem. Listen to this. Listen to the statement of Ibn al jawzi rahimahullah. He's a big personality from the scholars. He says, "I'lam no, أن الزمان لا يث لا يثبت على حال كما قال الله عز وجل وتلك الأيام he said, know that the times do not remain upon the same way. Meaning what? Sometimes there's going to be ups. Sometimes there's going to be down. Sometimes there's going to be ease. Sometimes there's going to be hardship. Sometimes you may experience poverty. Sometimes you may have a surplus. Sometimes you may experience triumph. Other times you will experience defeat. Right? He says, فَالسَّعِيدُ من لازم أصلا واحدة على كل حال. The one who is truly happy is the one who remains upon one state during all of those situations. وهو تقوى الله عز وجل. And that is by having taqwa of Allah. No matter what's going on, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're healthy, whether you're sick, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're in private, whether you, if you remain upon the taqwa of Allah at all times. You will be the most happiest of people. You will be the most happiest of people. Al Hafiz ibn Hajar, he said, Fasaidu man tamasaka bima kana alayhi salaf, wajtanaba ma ahdathahu al khalaf. He said, The happy person is the one whoever adheres to what the salaf were upon. Who are the salaf? Who are they? Man, man, who are the salaf? The early generation. Which early generation specifically? The first, number one, the Sahaba. The Sahaba and those who followed upon their way from the next two or three generations. The Tabi'een, the Tabi'oon wa Atba' at Tabi'een. These are what we call a Salaf al Salih, the righteous predecessors. What they were upon, what they adhered to. This is what the Prophet ﷺ told us to, to do. Khairun nas karni. The best of the people are those of my generation. 
ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ Then those who immediately come after them, then those who immediately come after them. السَّابِكُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ The first and foremost. مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ From the migrants and from the Ansar. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And those who followed them in righteousness. رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, وَمِمَّا يَمِيزُ أَهْلُ الْحَدِيثِ عَنْ غَيْرِهِمْ And from that which distinguishes the people of hadith from other than them, ثَبَاتُهُمْ عَلَى مَبَادِئِهِمْ عِنْدَ الْمِحَنِ وَالْفِتَنِ Is their remaining firm upon their fundamentals, even during times of trials and tribulations. In other words, what? They don't change. They stay upon that way. No matter what's going on. Look at when the Sahaba, when the Prophet ﷺ sent the group of companions to Habasha, to Abyssinia, the first, the, 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 the second time. I'm sorry, the first time. When they went there, Quraysh heard that they had went there to Abyssinia. Abyssinia, the, the, that was an ally. They, they did business with Quraysh. So Quraysh had a problem with the Muslims going there and possibly ruining their name, tainting their name, their image. So they sent someone there to Abyssinia to convince an Najashi to return the Muslims back to Mecca. However, as the Prophet ﷺ said, that king was a just king. So he listened to the Muslims, what they had to say, and he listened to the representative of Quraysh of what it is that he had to say. So when the, when, the, when the people who were sent by Quraysh, and I don't I remember the name of... No, 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 Abu Sufyan, he didn't go. He didn't go to Abyssinia. He went to Rome. That was conversation in Rome. I forget the name of the person who had not yet become Muslim. But when he saw that an Najashi was inclined towards listening to the Muslims, he tried to... He tried to sow seeds of enmity. He said, you don't know what these people say about uh, Christians, what their Quran say about Isa. Huh? At that moment, at that moment, typically what human beings do when they're, in a, when they're in a tough situation like that, they flip, they change, they say whatever is going to get, yeah, appease. To make the situation comfortable for them. Jafar ibn Abi Talib, he's the one who was the spokesperson for the Muslims who were there. He recited from the Quran, Surah Maryam. He mentioned what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Without tainting it, without changing it. And that is an example of what we're talking about. Taqwa of Allah in every time and in every situation. You see Muslims today here in the United States and in the UK... They are watering down the religion of Islam in order to appease other people. They think that by watering down Islam, these people are going to love you. They're not going to love you. Allah tell you in the Quran, they're never going to love you until you abandon your religion. They don't even care if you become Christian or Jew. They don't care about that. What they want is you to leave your religion. Abandon your religion. Give up your religion. When they see you upon your deen, adhering to your deen, yeah, subhanAllah. You know why? Because they're not adhering to their deen. They're not adhering to their religion. They're, they're, what they're doing today is nothing with Isa. They just not, if Isa alayhi salam come right now, he don't recognize nothing from that religion. They completely changed it. Baddalu deenahu alayhi salatu wasalam. They changed this religion. From every area, even in the matter of aqidah, they changed. Nothing remained the same. Even the name. There was no such thing as Christian. It's not, a, it's not even mentioned in the Bible. Not one place. Not one place is mentioned in the Bible. Yani subhanallah. So the point is here, and I'm putting emphasis on this. I could focus uh, on the other part, yani, and perhaps maybe next week, Allahu A'la, maybe we will come back and we will revisit that. But I wanted to focus on taqwa because a lot of us lose track of what Ramadan was really all about. Ramadan was all about taqwa. 
كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Fasting was prescribed for you just as it was prescribed for those who came before you so that you may have taqwa. So if you haven't increased in taqwa, what are you so happy about? <laughs> as the scholars say, every day is Ramadan for the muttaqeen. And the Eid is the day they meet Allah. That is the true Eid. The true Eid, the true day of happiness is the day the muttaqeen, they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the believer in this life, the whole, oh, it's always Ramadan. Why? The Prophet said, Ad-dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This dunya is a prison for the believer and a jannah for the kafir. The believer has, he's restricted, like in a prison. In a prison, you what? You cannot, you, you, you can only go certain places. And you can, in even those places, you can only go at certain times. And you have to do it like this. You have to wear your clothes like that. Yeah, certain time, lights out. The Prophet ﷺ used this example. He said, dunya sijnul mu'min. This dunya is a sijn, a prison for the Muslim. Yes, in this life we are restricted. So the day of the real true Eid is the day the believers meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will stop there with regard to taqwa. As regard to the good character, be behaving with the people with good character, then I'm going to say just two things, inshallah. The first thing, all of the religion is khuluq, character. The religion in its entirety is character. Whoever has more good character has more deen. Yani, فَمَنْ زَادَ عَلَيْكَ فِي الْخُلُقِ زَادَ عَلَيْكَ فِي الدين. Whoever surpasses you in character has surpassed you in religion. It's number one. Number two, good character has four arkan. I didn't put this in the notes, but it's in other. When we, we talked about this before, some of you probably remember this. There's four hadith in the 40 hadith of Imam al Nawawi that are considered to be the four arkan of good character. One of them, is the hadith لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب ما يحب حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. This is one pillar of good character. Loving for others what you love for yourself. Another hadith من 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 كان من من كان يؤمن بالله وباليوم الآخر فليكل خيرا أو لا يصمد Whoever believes in Allah on the last day let him say what's good or remain silent. This is the second pillar. To control your tongue. To control your mouth. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever can guarantee for me what is between the two jaws and what is between his legs, I guarantee for him paradise. So this is the second pillar of good character. To guard your mouth. What comes out of your mouth. What you say. The third pillar of good character. The Prophet Sallallahu said, من حسن إسلام المرئي تركه ما لا يعني From the good of a person in Islam is to leave alone what doesn't concern him. That's the third pillar. To leave alone whatever doesn't concern you, leave it alone. And we talked about that. We had a class on that. To leave it alone. And this is general. That means what? It even applies to social media. If you have a social media account, Let's say you have Twitter or Telegram or Facebook, TikTok, whatever the case may be. Then that means what? If you're on there, anything that doesn't concern you, Islamically, you're supposed to avoid it and stay away from it. That's how you guard your iman. That's how you guard your heart. That's how you guard your deen. And the fourth pillar of good character is found in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ was approached by the man who said, O Messenger of Allah, give me some advice. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La taghdab. Don't become angry. And the man, he repeated his question and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam repeated again, La taghdab. Don't become angry. And then the same thing happened a third time. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, La taghdab. Don't become angry. So the fourth pillar is what? To control yourself. Self-control. Controlling your tongue. Wanting for others what you want for yourself. Leaving alone what doesn't concern you and controlling 
yourself. These are the arcan of good character. Why is that important to know? Because you have to have all four of these in order to be considered someone who possesses good character. If any one of these four is missing, you don't have good character. This is very important. This is very, very important. Good character. And that is the true beauty of a person. Look at the Prophet said in the one dua. The Prophet, one of the supplications of the Prophet, he said, he said, Allahumma ahsan ta khalqi fa hassan khuluqi. He said, Oh Allah, you have beautified my physical creation. You've made me handsome. So make my character handsome. Make it beautiful. This is the dua of the Prophet. ﷺ. That's the true beauty. You could be the most handsome person in the world. If you have nasty character, you're not a handsome, you're not a good person. Good character is what is the true beauty. Yes, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said in the hadith, "Akmalu al-mu'minina imanan ahsanuhum khuluqa." The most complete of the believers in iman are the best of them in character. He said in another hadith, "Ma min shay'in afqalu fil mizani min husn al-khuluq." There is nothing that is going to be heavier in the scales, the mizan, on the day of judgment, min husn al-khuluq than good character. That's what's going to weigh the most. You know, some people think that in order to be a cause for people to enter into Islam, you have to be very, very eloquent. Actually, people will be inclined to listen to you and want to know about this religion just from watching the way you behave. Just by watching the way you behave, especially now more than ever, because people are lost. People are in darkness. To see someone who's upon khair, to see him upon goodness, following the Prophet wasallam, that's something that stands out. You stand out in your workplace. You stand out in a university. You stand out in your school. If you're following, especially you young people, if you are one of those people who are, mashallah, you pray your five prayers. You don't compromise with your salah. You stand out. People may make some jokes. They may say, look at Muhammad. He, there he goes again. He's going to pray. But you know what? They can make those jokes. At the end of the day, when they, you know what they really think about you? They say, man, he has discipline. He has discipline. I wish I could be like that. They're not going to say it out loud. But that's what they're thinking. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This is what I remember being in junior high school as a kafir. And I remember seeing Muslim young boys and girls in my school. I wasn't Muslim at the time, but I used to admire when I used to see the Muslims and how, you know, in Ramadan, like I remember this one brother, subhanAllah, he would fast in Ramadan. And in, and of course, they made you come to the cafeteria. That was a session. So he would just sit there. <laughs> Everyone's eating and he would not indulge. And I thought to myself, wow, this this requires a lot of discipline. So don't be don't be fooled. Don't think that because you're because you're Muslim, you know, and you're doing the right thing. And you don't follow the status quo. You're not doing. You're not doing what everyone else is doing. Don't think that that's that's not cool. Believe me, you cool. You on the Sunday, you a cool dude, man. And the sisters as well. That sister who's covering properly. Those ladies, cause the young ladies, could say whatever they want. At the end of the day, they they they're jealous of that sister. They wish number one. They wish number one that they had a family that she has. Many of these young ladies in these schools, they don't have a family. They don't have fathers in their lives. <laughs> you know, one of the day, one day I was picking my daughter up uh, from campus and uh, she was with one of the young ladies there on the campus. And she, I called her and I let her know I'm there. She was like, okay, daddy, I'm coming. And the girl said, you call your father daddy? <laughs> you call him daddy? She said, yeah, what's wrong with that? She said, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. And I told my daughter, I said, that's because she, her father is not in her life. So it sounds strange. It sounds foreign. Wallahi, these women out here, even though they look all tough and macho, Wallahi, they envy the Muslim woman. The Muslim woman, mashallah, her father or her husband or her brother is taking her to the store, picking her up, making sure that, you know, she is taken care of, that she's not out there by herself and wandering. 
some of these women are working two, three jobs to make ends meet because they don't have no help. Believe me, they may not say it, but they're thinking it. Wow, I wish I had it like those women. They could just take care of the house and take care of the children and not have to work and have someone go out and do these things. Wallahi, this is something nadir, rare in these times. These guys, these these guys out here now, they don't want to, they want, they don't want to take care of all the responsibilities. They say 50-50. 50 50. You're going to pay the utilities, you're going to pay this, and I'll take care of this over here. No, oh, but the Muslim man, Allah said, What? The men are the providers and maintainers of the women. That's what our religion said, alhamdulillah. This is the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you should be proud and be happy. Allah guide you to Islam and made you a Muslim. Never look down on your or feel like you need to hide your Islam or you need to change. No, no, alhamdulillah. Keep it a buck, as they say. Keep it a buck all the time. You Muslim. And more and, and even greater than that, you are Muslim who's upon the Sunnah. Following the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are from Al Ghuraba, inshaAllah. If you are following the Sunnah today, you are a stranger. As the Prophet said, Tuba lil ghuraba. Glad tidings are for the strangers. They said, Who are the strangers, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Those who are adhering to my way, following my sunnah, those who rectify themselves, those who try to correct the affairs when the people have become corrupted. When the vast majority of the people are going one way, Abdullah and Amatullah, they're going the other way. Alhamdulillah. And with that, I won't keep you. Before you call the adhan, if, yani, if someone needs to go, you can go. I just want to let you know, but when the adhan is called, you cannot leave. Unless due to darura. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited that. This is why I tried to end a little earlier so that those who need to leave can leave. Once the adhan is called, you're not supposed to leave the masjid unless you are intending to return. Like, for example, you're going out to the car or maybe you're, you're going to go back to your side of Buffalo and you're going to get to the masjid closest to your house huh? before the ikama. You're not supposed to leave after hearing the adhan. So, inshallah, before they call the adhan, anyone who needs to leave, you do what you got to do. Inshallah. Yes, brother. Al Ghuraba, Aywa. This masjid is looking for a name. Why do you think Masjid Al Ghuraba? <laughs> You're gonna frighten everybody away from here. The masjid of the strangers. I don't think I I, I think uh, and it's it's okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I me I have I have like three names in my mind. One name I think is really good for a masjid. Is Masjid al Istikama. Masjid al Istikama. I think this name is beautiful. And the meaning is beautiful. You know what al Istikama mean? Al Istikama means to adhere, to be firm, and to stick to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Look what Allah says. Inna ladina kalu rabbun Allah thumma istikamu tatanazzalu. عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ أَلَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ Verily those who say that our Lord is Allah and then they have istiqama. Huh? That the, the angels will descend upon them at the time of their death and they will say don't fear nor grieve but rather have the glad tidings of Jannah which you were promised. Another name, a good name for Masjid, Masjid al-Sunnah. Masjid al-Sunnah. Alhamdulillah, let it be common. Like we need to make it more common. Masjid al-Sunnah. But I will tell you something that's even more important than the name. Regardless of what you name the masjid, you got to make sure that you are upon that. There are many people today, they name their masjid, masjid taqwa. But you go, there's no taqwa there. <laughs> what point, what good is there having this beautiful name, but the quality, the characteristic, you don't find it in that masjid. You know? Uh, masjid al-Sunnah, Masjid uh, uh, Al-Istiqama, Masjid Al-Tawheed, Masjid Abu Bakr. Masjid Abu Bakr, I think, is a really good name. Muslims should need to know who Abu Bakr is. They need to know who Abu Bakr is. Uh, masjid Al-Ghuraba, I know there's a masjid named Al-Ghuraba, I think, in England. One is in Illinois. One is in Illinois? 
the 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 one in the grand what's that? No, that's the Grand Islamic Center. It's Grand Islamic Center. Maybe we should put together a list. We take put together a list, inshallah. But I, yani, mashallah, may Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah give us tawfiq and may Allah make this masjid a beacon of light in West New York. Because wallahi, people people are in dire need of ilm, as-sahih, correct knowledge. They need it badly, wallahi, they need it badly. People are, they don't know. They don't know many, many things about the religion. The children they are in need of it. Not just memorizing Quran, but actually studying the Quran, studying the Sunnah, studying the Arabic language, learning fiqh, how to properly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many masajid don't talk about these things. Yes, brother. I go back to this topic. Wa kulu lin nasi husna. Everybody. everybody, you gotta. Everybody, you're supposed to be good to. Yes, everybody. Jazakallah uh khair. Yani. Canada, I beat you from buses to strong you hand. Two things Allah says. One <coughs> strong by his brother Harun. Another will be strong the buses of Quran. Okay? Yes. Naam. Yani the first thing you mention is that Allah says, "Wakulu linasi hostas." Be say what's good to people. That's that's general. Muslims should be like this with everybody. Of course, with the Muslim, you do it even more. You do it even more with the Muslim. Today we're doing it the opposite way around. We're doing it less with the Muslim, and we're doing it with other people. And as far as the second point you mentioned. Then this is this these verses were mentioned in the context of calling the people, giving da'wah. One of the ways Allah aided Musa alayhi salam is with his brother Harun, right? Because one of the Musa had an impediment in his speech, right? So it's very important when giving da'wah that you that you speak clearly and eloquently, that you communicate the message, and also with Allah's signs. Allah gave him signs. Every every prophet, every messenger was given signs. So that the people, when they see these signs, that they would believe in it. And the greatest sign that Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ is the Quran. Which means what? That means Muslims have to know this book very well so that we can call the people to Islam with this book. That's how we give da'wah. That's how we got to call these people to Islam. Now, inshallah. Here let me... Hmm? Ah. Fatih Awaf, Surah Fatih, verse 28. Now, so Jazakumullah Khair, I appreciate you all for coming. Again, I can't stress it enough. It's very important. The Those of you who received the copy of the book, read it, inshallah. Try to read it before coming to class. Review it. And uh, and those who come regularly who didn't make it tonight, inshallah, we're going to leave copies behind for them. Uh, there's a question here before we call the Adhan, inshallah. The question is, what if there is a masjid called Masjid al Bid'ah, but they are upon the Sunnah in that masjid? <laughs> if they are upon the Sunnah, I cannot imagine them naming their masjid Bid'ah. That's <laughs> no, no. What? Uh, or maybe what the, the question means is that what if people call the masjid a masjid of Bid'ah? Maybe that's what the question. What if the people are calling this masjid a masjid of Bid'ah, but the people are upon the Sunnah in that masjid? That's probably what they're asking. If that is the case, then those who are calling the masjid a masjid of bid'ah, they are committing a grave crime, a serious crime. They are guilty of many crimes. They are guilty of lying. They are guilty of slandering. And in doing so, they have the description as, as Allah says, yusudduna 
an sabilillah. They prevent people from the path of Allah by calling that masjid a masjid of bid'ah. No, if the masjid is, you're going to call a masjid of bid'ah, then you have to have dalil to say that this masjid is a, a, a masjid of bid'ah. Some people will make a conclusion about a masjid because of some of the people who come and pray there. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Like someone said about this masjid, it's a tablighi masjid because someone from Jamaat al tablighi came here and prayed. So what? That doesn't make a masjid Jamaat al tablighi If the tablighi want to come here and make salah, ahlan wa sahlan. We will invite them, absolutely. Our brothers, let them come. That doesn't make the masjid, uh, masjid tablighi because someone is tablighi come here. We not a, this is not a cult. You know a cult? A cult is like only certain people can come and other. No, we don't have that. No, everyone is welcome. Masjid Baytullah. Invite the people to come and learn the religion. Evil, no matter who they are. No matter who they are, let them come. Even the kafir, he want to come. You remember several months ago, a guy from my job came here. He's a he's a deacon. You remember? And the Jumu'ah, he sit in the back, you know? SubhanAllah. Yes, welcome. Come, no problem. The Prophet ﷺ had a man, there was a man tied to the, one of the pillars in the Prophet's masjid for three days. The Prophet released him, and the man, he became Muslim. Why? Because after those three days, after him observing the Muslims and seeing the Muslims and seeing the what? The akhlaq, the character, the way the Muslims behave. He's the, in, in seeing everything, he wanted to become Muslim. He wanted to become a part of this ummah. So this is where we're going to end, inshallah. Subhanaka Allahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik. Allahu <laughs> Akbar <laughs>